Sashrikal, everyone. I'm Sonia Dhami, joining you from Cupertino, California. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this inaugural tour of Sikh treasures across the world, but virtually. We are excited to take this trip with you and experience Sikh art up close, hear some engaging backstories, and meet some amazing people. But today, when I say the words sick art, we are fortunately very comfortable and familiar with these terms. But this was not always so. In fact, these two terms were hardly ever used together. So there's a story here. And when I try to trace this history back, I found that this term sick art was used for the first time in the journal Sikh Sansar published by the Sikh Foundation in 1975 in its special edition on Sikh arts. It was in this journal that the term Sikh art was introduced as a genre. The widely respected Professor R.P. Srivastava was the guest editor of this volume. And I'd like to share a few lines from his editorial comments because it gives us a clear picture of what was the state of Sikh arts in 1975. And I quote, for the first time in the history of journalism, a systematic attempt is being made to record the significant contributions made by Sikh artists, sculptors, architects, and artisans in the Punjab and elsewhere. No concerted effort was ever made by any author or historian, and so far no one has tried to write anything on this aspect of achievement of the Sikhs, which has glorified the pages of Sikh history and beautified the Punjab with architectural monuments." Unquote. This was the sad landscape as recent as 1975. There were no museums doing exhibits of Sikh art and there were hardly any publications on the subject. But when we fast forward to today, we find Sikh art is celebrated in museums. There are dozens of publications on the subject. There is a growing number of Sikh artists, authors, curators, art historians, dealers, and so many other related professions. Today, we also have permanent galleries of Sikh art at established museums. And the first of which was the Satinder Kaur Kapani Gallery of Sikh art set up in 2003 at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. And this Today, I am happy to say that the Phoenix Art Museum also has a permanent gallery of Sikh art established by the Kanuja family. Out, the most interesting aspect that I find of these developments is the increasing interest by collectors. And today, we have some spectacular collections uh, here in the US, there is the Kanuja family, the Mahal family. There are some inspiring collections in Canada and the UK. And what it allows us to realize in hindsight is that a mind shift has been accomplished in these 50 odd years, which has brought us from this desolate, pervasive, false narrative of a cultural desert, which was associated with our community to a place which is vibrant and alive today. And for this, as a community, we are indebted to our collectors. Amongst the first of these pioneers was Satinder Kaur and Narinder Singh Kapani. It is their vision and dedication 
through which they collected these artworks from far and wide and presented to us in a collection in the first ever exhibit on sick heart, which was in 1992 at the Asian Art Museum. Validating to us as a community, as well as to the world, that Sikhs have an artistic heritage, which is as old as themselves. And it includes not just some beautiful portraits of the Sikh gurus or spectacular paintings of the Golden Temple, but also royal arts and treasures of the Maharajas, arms and armaments, architecture and wall monuments, illustrated manuscripts, stamps, coins, textiles, contemporary arts. To me, it is mind blowing. And this is what provided the motivation to document this premier collection in our book, Sick Art from the Kapani Collection, which I have the honor to co-edit with the distinguished Dr. Paul Michael Taylor of the Smithsonian. I'm happy to announce that this book is now available for a free digital download on our website, sickfoundation.org, as well as on academia.edu. But I also encourage you to buy your hard copy soon because it is soon going to be a collector's item. Now, many of these collections, these spectacular collections that have really changed the dynamics for us, they finally end up in museums because it is the museums that allow us to share our pride in our arts and heritage across communities and across any barriers of language, color, race, or religion. And it is the museums that continue to inspire our generations to come and ensure that our arts and heritage continue to inspire them. Today, sadly, we are in the midst of a time when a pandemic is raging in our communities and a push for social change is erupting on our streets. This has changed a lot of what we took for granted. Things like summer vacations and travel plans have been put on hold. So while our museums are closed during this period of lockdown, but the art that they hold is still accessible to us. So with technology at our fingertips and some inspiring and passionate six like Ranveer Singh to guide us, we can continue to enjoy our arts and learn from history, all from the comfort of our homes. Today, we hope to spend about an hour with you during which uh, my co-host Ranveer Singh will take us to four museums across the city of London. And most of the images that you will see during this presentation are also available on the Sikh Foundation app, uh, which is uh, available for iOS. And you can continue to enjoy these uh, images. Uh, the app is Sikh Foundation International. My co-host today is Ranveer Singh, who is the mover and shaker of the community initiative, A Little History of the Sikhs, which brings alive for me and you, Sikh history on the streets of London, in the museums uh, in the UK and in the rest of Europe. I met uh, Ranveer, or Rav as he is popularly called, earlier this year, and I was fascinated with the stories that he shared. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to him today. So my co-host today is Ranveer Singh. He is the mover and shaker of the community initiative a Little History of the Six, which brings alive for me and you, Sikh history 
in the streets and museums of London and in the rest of Europe. And I met uh, Ranveer or Rav as he is popularly called earlier this year. And I was fascinated with the stories that he shared. It is my pleasure to introduce you to him. Welcome to the show Ranveer. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you thought of starting a little history of the Sikhs and what keeps you going. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, it really does feel surreal to be um, under the banner of the Sikh Foundation International. I've been a follower and a fan for most of my adult life. Um, the story of a little history of the Sikhs is actually a personal journey. It's um, of being a Sikh, but also being a Londoner, um, a Londoner through and through. Um, however, as a Sikh, I don't fit that narrative of an NRI, um, having been born in London. Um, but in London, um, with this appearance, no one ever quite associates you with being a Londoner. So the walking tours in London or the day trips that we do in the south of England and study visits across the UK and Europe are actually retelling personal journeys of finding my connection to our Sikh heritage, Sikh history, and ultimately Gurbani and Sikhi by initially walking those streets of London. Back to you, Ben. So if I go, should we go to the next? Yeah. So this is amazing, Rav. Let's get the show on the road. Yep, brilliant. So as I said, so as I said, I'm a London-born Sikh and um, always lived, worked and relaxed in London for all of my life. Um, so with that brief, just a short video about the highlights of London streets. Star market kicking up the paper with his worn out shoes. In his eyes, you see no pride, and helplessly at his side. Yesterday's paper telling yesterday's news. So, how can you tell me your love? And say to you that the sun don't shine. Let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. Show you something to make you change your mind. Let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. Show you something to make you change your mind. Welcome to the streets of London. Um, so this is a governance map of London and shows you the um, I'll put this laser on, but it shows you the historic city of London here in the center. The city of London is surrounded by 32 boroughs um, that make up the whole of London, Greater London. And as that song detailed um, from Ralph McTell, um, the streets of London contain a wealth of stories, many of which can help you to change your perspective. In the west of London, we have the most famous part of London associated with Punjabi communities. Um, around the world. We have Heathrow Airport here, but very close by is the famous little town of Southall or Southall in the London Borough of Ealing. So that's in the west of London, which most communities associate with Sikhs in London. So I live in the east of London over in this part and um, in a borough called Redbridge. And um, we have a little part of um, Punjab here as well, uh, but we call it Little Lahore down in um, the south of the borough near Ilford. It's called Little Lahore. And today's tour is going to take us through the centre of London. Yeah. 
Now, as I say, on most of my tours, it's all about bringing the past alive because we believe that the past is always alive if it is remembered and knowledge has life and power as long as it is saved from human forgetfulness. Just moving on to our next one. So as I said, the tour is gonna to take place um, virtually today now um, through these boroughs in London. We're gonna start in the West at Kensington and Chelsea. Um, and close by to that borough is the famous um, Big Ben in London in the city of Westminster. We'll go across the center to the east of the city where we have Tower Bridge around here on the border with Tower Hamlets. And through that journey, we'll explore these museums. So we'll be visiting the Victoria and Albert Museum. We'll move across to the Museum of London, go to the Tower of London, um, and also pass by the Natural History Museum and then end over at the Museum of London. So with that overview, we'll get started with our tour. So this is the, the original old building associated with the Victoria and Albert Museum in South Kensington. Now the origins of this museum lie with the Great Exhibition of 1851, where Henry Cole, the museum's first director, planned this exhibition with Prince Albert, who was Queen Victoria's husband. Now, at the end of that exhibition, um, Henry Cole purchased many of the exhibits and started to form the first collections. Now, by 1855, those collections were housed here in this Brompton Park house. And this was extended to include refreshment rooms across the ground floor here. So you'll see those refreshment rooms all across the bottom. And then the collections were housed above. And on the 22nd of June in 1857, this was re renamed the South Kensington Museum. And that opening ceremony was conducted by Queen Victoria. Now, by 17th of May, 1899, so we're looking about 42 years on, um, Queen Victoria was back and she laid the foundation for this new extension called the Aston Webb Building. Now, this occasion in 1899 was her last official public appearance. And it was announced on that day that the museum again was going to be renamed, but this time as the Victoria and Albert Museum. Now, if you look at the museum today, if we take a look at the museum today, it actually is very, very large. Here's that original building I showed you, the Brompton Park House. And then this extension was put on and it's 12,000 square meters of space here, the Aston Webb Building Extension, just circled in red here. And around here at the front of the galleries, we find the um, Sikh Kingdom Gallery. So when you come in through the main entrance and turn left, you end up in the Sikh Kingdom Gallery. And it's there which we're gonna look at some of the items housed there now. So as we go here, you'll find this item, which is one of the museum's most prized items. And it's the throne of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, described as the golden throne. Now this throne is made of wood, but engraved in gold and was crafted by a goldsmith by the name of Hafez Muhammad Maldani, sometime between 1820 and 1830. So it's during the height of the Sikh empire, that period. Now, as you can see, it comprises of two lotus petal shaped octagonal um, uh, designs. And both elements having lotus flowers and these octagonal shapes are reflective of Mughal furniture. Now in Europe, the royal furniture that we have is usually very simply gilded and it creates the effect of gold without incurring that cost. However, this throne from the court of Lahore is covered in thick sheet gold and is heavily ornamented. Now the throne was first displayed with other treasures at that exhibition I told you about earlier, the Great Exhibition of 1851, after it was taken by the British in 1849 on the annexation of the Punjab following the Second Anglo-Sikh War. So, Rav, can I take yeah, over? Yeah, it's back. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, back so back. the b and is, uh, indeed has a very impressive collection of uh, Sikh art 
probably one of the earliest museum collections in the world. And it is this collection that formed the core of the, the multimedia and hugely successful exhibit, The Arts of the Sick Kingdoms, uh, which was on in 1999. And uh, when I was working on our book, The Sick Art from the Kapani Collection, it is then that I got a full appreciation of what it takes to put up a show like this one. And all the work, the networking, the contacts, meeting the people, raising the funds, doing the marketing, so much work goes into it. And for this show, it all started with Dr. Kapani, who is the founding chairman of the Sikh Foundation. And he contacted Susan Strong, who is the curator of the Victoria and Albert Museum in early 1992 to see if it was possible for the paintings, the Sikh paintings, which had been cataloged and published uh, in by W.G. Archer in his book, if those paintings could travel to uh, San Francisco for the first ever exhibit on Sikh arts at the Asian Art Museum. Now, uh, that was not possible for whatever reasons for the museum, it was too short a time. But what resulted from this relationship is best explained in Susan Strong's own words, which is published in our book, The Sick Art from the Kapani Collection. And I'd like to share a small excerpt uh, uh, for, from that with you. I quote, in the months that followed, the proposal evolved into something larger and much more ambitious. Narinder looked ahead to 1999 and the 300th anniversary of the Khalsa. Perhaps we could do an exhibition to mark this instead. And five years later, the Arts of the Sikh Kingdom was opened at the VNA, unquote. This exhibit was a blockbuster show. It had over 500,000 people visit it across three cities. There was London, San Francisco, and Toronto. But the most important thing for me was that it inspired the Sikh youth who for the first time were introduced to their arts and heritage in this unique manner. And this throne that you just showed today, uh, Rav, was a highlight of that exhibit. And uh, Rav, did you get to attend the exhibition when it was or how old were you then? <laughs> yes, so 19, 1999 um, was yeah. interesting because that was the last year of my um, degree. And I oh. studied actually at Imperial College London, which is opposite the v &A, and is actually where Dr. Kapani did his first yeah. um, set of postgraduate studies after he arrived from India. I didn't know that at the time. I just knew that there was an exhibition on Sikhi um, opposite our university. And oh. um, they approached our little Sikh society and they said, we need some help with volunteering. And so I used to sit at the front of the museum and just guide people as they came off the coaches, um, especially the Sikh groups that used to come from all over the UK. And my simple job really in Punjabi and English was just to guide them to the toilets. Um, <laughs> gents on the right, ladies on the left. That's all I did for about six weeks <laughs> with my books. So it was a good time. That was an introduction too then, I think. So you were one of those youth that I talked about who were inspired by this uh, exhibit. Definitely. And uh, I, had a, I believe that there are other versions of this throne as well. Uh, yes. Do you know those, Rav? And... Uh, are they in yeah. London or where are they? Yeah, so we have replicas of this throne. Um, so we have a wooden replica that's also held in the collections by the V&A. And I believe there's a second wooden um, replica, which is in a private collection. And after our tour earlier today, people have been sending me other replicas and other chairs and thrones across Lahore and other parts in India, all associated with Ranjit Singh. So, but for me, um, you know, this throne is a beautiful piece. It is part of the tours that we do in London for visitors who are first time visitors to the V&A and they are mesmerized by it. But when this um, object um, goes on tour, 
as you mentioned, it will go to San Francisco, it does go to Toronto and other cities. What's interesting is what they put in its place. Now, if we have a look at the next picture, which I'll just bring up on screen, and I'll just pin my video again. So if we have a look at this picture here, so this is a picture of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. Um, it's in the um, Asian Art Museum, as you described, in the galleries of the Sapinder um, Gaur Kapani collection. It's by the British artist um, Emily Eden, um, following her visits to India. Um, and it shows Maharaja Ranjit Singh on this ivory chair. So when the throne actually goes on tour to other places, and it was in Coventry um, last year as well, I think, or the year before, then they actually put the ivory chairs on display instead. Now, I find these more of interest because they very rarely come on display, um, but they are very much associated with um, other images of Ranjit Singh. And I understand where he, he usually sat, um, preferred to sit, sit on his ivory chair. Now, so if we just move on now to other parts of the collection, um, I'll take you through this section here. Um, the museum actually houses these fine examples of um, the stars. Now, this the star on the left. Um, it's dated from the mid 1850s, um, and the description reads: "An agulli turban, cotton wrapped over a wicker frame with quoits and other embellishments of watered steel overlaid with gold." Now, this version on the left. Um, is usually on display. But interestingly, they also have another fine example of a dastar, this second dastar on the right, um, a tall conical turban made of black cotton over a cane base, which is attached a vertical spike and shimitar shaped horns here. These horns and these nine quoits um, around this structure, ring shaped, sharp edged steel weapons of various sizes. Now the museum, um, describes um, these turbans of being associated with Sikhs known as Agallis, and members of this sect are also known as Nahangs from the Persian word meaning crocodile and Nahang and crocodile signify qualities of ferocity and fearlessness and they describe the Agallis as being an order of armed fighters amongst baptized Sikhs. So we have the throne and we have the marshal, the stars, but we also have at the VNA these fine examples of Indian musical instruments. Um, and this is an example of a Taos from 1882 from the collection of Karl Engel. And this comes on display um, on a rotation basis in the Indian classical instrument section. Now this instrument, um, as many may be familiar with, um, sits um, on the floor with the upper end resting on the left shoulder of the musician who sits cross-legged. Now the description describes the Taos as being emerging from the Punjab region and becoming popular in Northern and Central India. It's associated with Sikh devotional music and many credit its invention to one of the great Sikh gurus. I've just got some additional photos here. So later on, we'll be speaking to Daran, whose um, his, um, teamwork with Sikh Museum Initiative have created um, these photos as well which just kind of highlight how beautiful this object is. When you're actually facing the golden throne of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, behind you is this beautiful image of the native lady of Amritsar. Now, the interesting thing for me here is um, the size, the sheer size of this painting. It's nearly six foot in size. And that's me standing there. And it's really, and still, I think you can't see how big this painting really is from the angle of this photo. It's 1.83 meters in size, so also, um, so almost life size. And it really is a magnificent piece. And it can be easily overlooked when you visit the um, Art, um, the Sea Kingdoms Gallery. So, Sonia, I'm just going to ask you now, I'm going to hand over to you to take us through this painting. And I yeah, will have the next slide. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ranveer. So uh, looking at this marvelous painting, I'm first struck by the Mona Lisa look that the lady has on her face. And as I peer closely, I see a beautiful young woman wearing an array of jewels 
in dazzling gold, silver, diamonds, emeralds, and other gemstones. Sadly, we don't know whose portrait this is. We don't know what is the name of this lady. And even the name of the artist is not confirmed. But what we do know is that this painting was commissioned by the city of Amritsar uh, to be shown in the colonial and Indian exhibition in London in 1886 and was then bought by the museum. And the painting was commissioned to be a kind of a documentary record of the jewelry and the costumes of the region of Punjab in, in the 19th century. And what I'd like to do is to invite you all to closely examine this painting with me while I share with you uh, the Punjabi names of the different uh, pieces of jewelry that she's wearing, because that gives us an idea of the richness and the diversity of India's uh, artisans and craftsmen. So let's start at the top. And uh, if you look on her forehead is an elegant tikka and above which she wears this big elaborate ornament, which is called the Matha Patti. And on her nose is this huge nut or the nose ring, which is practically covering the full impact of her face. And her ears are also covered with these large earrings called Dandi Chunki, and above which are the Sagi full and Jhumar in her hair. And on her neck, she wears two, three different types of necklaces. And around her left arm, uh, she has an ornament called the Baju Band. And now as we move uh, and look at her hands, we see gold chains, which are all, uh, kind of attached to her fingers and the wrist. And this is called an RC. And on her fingers is a selection of rings, including a mirror ring which was a very convenient way for the lady to check her vanity uh, at all times. And on her wrists and, uh, is an armful of gold and kundal bangles and bracelets. Now, since this painting was commissioned as a documentary record of the jewelry and the costumes of the, of the region, that is very evident from the pose of the, of the lady who's, uh, who's been painted, which you see in the full scape uh, painting on the right hand side and which, which she's shown holding up her, her skirt so as to make, uh, make, make visible the jewelry that she's wearing on her feet as well. And so when we look at her feet, we notice that what the jewelry here is also as elaborate and exquisite as the other pieces, but these pieces are not made in gold. They are of silver. And this is because of the traditional uh, sanctity that was accorded to gold and it was not considered appropriate to wear it on your feet. So I would invite you to take a moment to just take in all of this uh, painting. And as we look at it, we also see that apart from her jewelry, her clothes are also equally stunning. In fact, she's actually wearing two sets of clothes. So there's one layer on, on the, underneath and over which there's an, another complete whole set, which consists of two large head and body coverings. There's the tunic, a full skirt and pajamas. On the outside is her embroidery transparent shawl, underneath which is another green dupatta and a red colored tunic or a kameez that is edged with a white band in gold thread work called Zari. She holds up her full blue skirt or kagra as it is called, under which we catch a glimpse of the red churidar pajamas that she's wearing. Her slippers are also embroidered with metal thread and they are in front of her. So while I'm just, uh, I'm just find this an exquisite piece of, uh, Art and I going gaga over this magnificent portrait. Rav, I recalled uh, you say that most of the people in your tour group uh, don't find this to be of much interest, uh, interest to them. And I find this observation to be very interesting. Why do you think people uh, kind of uh, don't give it the attention you think they should? 
Yeah, I think um, many of the tour groups um, are usually visiting the museum for the first time um, or they haven't been for many years. And so really for them, the tour is all about the, the most exquisite, expensive items on display, which I mean by gold, you know, so the golden throne captures everyone's attention. They move on to maybe the turbans and a few people maybe take a look at the um, musical instruments unless guided to. And this is actually behind you, this painting. You know, so this painting is watching you watch everything else. You know, that's the way I see it. And I, I, I look at people and even when they walk past this painting, they don't read the card and the way Amritsar is spelt with a U, they don't even connect that to the golden city of Amritsar for the Sikhs. So I watch all this and I think amazing. And then at the end of the tour of that section, I bring them to this painting and I said, no one noticed this one, but look at her, look at this, look at the jewelry. And they have the actual jewelry items to the left and right, many exquisite items, you know, and you can spend a long time looking at this, but one is the positioning, two is the fact that they don't associate um, a name to this painting, because as you said, this is called the Lady of Amritsar. Um, that may be a factor, you know, if it had a glorious title that people were aware of, then they would look for this item, because it's, it's always, you know, the throne is always described as Ranjit Singh's Gursi, the Lahore um, kingdom's, you know, a chair, you know, so then that they go looking for that, and that's where the attention is. Yeah, this is, uh, what you're saying is very interesting. And uh, I've been thinking about it since you mentioned it to me during our conversations and what you just said about her not having a name. So uh, I was thinking like, you know, is it uh, that this is like, we give it a thought to what we consider worthy of claiming proudly as our heritage and what we ignore and why. So while we had taken the sheer beauty of the painting itself uh, of this portrait, and let us imagine that if, let us imagine for a moment that this was a portrait of some Maharani or a princess or a Rani, and it had a name to it, then uh, how would we react to it? Compared to what we know now that we don't know who this is and it's probably the a painting of a unknown courtesan. So does that impact what we proudly claim as our heritage and what we ignore because it does not fit into uh, today's popular narrative. So this is just something uh, I think we can all think about. And the second uh, thought also that came to my mind was that we don't have, sadly, very many visual references of women from 19th century Punjab. So the clothes that she's wearing do not fit into what we associate with clothes for sick women, you know, today that we, when we think of sick women from that period, that is not the visual memory uh, we have, just because we don't have so many uh, references. But I know for a fact that this is true, that this, these were clothes that were worn by Sikhs, because I've seen these uh, kagras or these skirts, my grandmother owned a number of them, and she told us stories about it, that whenever she was to leave the household for whatever reason. Be, uh, she was living in a village. So while she was wearing the salwar kameez and dupatta inside the home, but when she stepped out, she would quickly just wear a kagra over her clothes and then drape this big chadar around her face and cover the upper part of her body. So uh, in a manner which is quite like uh, this, this lady. So these are just some things that I think to do with what the visual, a cultural visual training is. So uh, I'm glad you, you brought this, uh, you selected this painting to, to talk about today. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna end at the V&A and we're gonna travel across London. We're gonna go to the east, to the boundary between the city of London and the London Borough of Tower Hamlets. And that's where the Tower of London is located. Now, this is actually a fortress and was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. That's nearly 1,000 years ago. It's preserved um, as a heritage site. Um, and it's got lots and lots of different stories associated with it, with all the various kings and queens over the last 1,000 years or so. But it serves now um, 
um, to function as a protector of the crown jewels. So if we go down a page. So these are the famous beef eater yeoman warders on the left here in red. Um, and they are the traditional guards of the Tower of London. But it also has legendary stories associated with the ravens here. And within this complex, you'll have the crown jewels chamber, which you enter and you'll see all of the crown jewels on display. Um, and there's usually, it's like a travelator. You stand on this travelator and you go across this room and you can see the jewels, but you can't really get off the travelator. And you just, just go through the room and to the rest of the uh, complex. Um, you do pay to go in, um, but every Indian or every Punjabi or many Sikhs that visit, their sole focus is to take a glimpse of this famous diamond, the legendary Kohinoor. Now, today, the legendary Kohinoor is um, kept on a crown. It's only been worn by female members of the royal family. And Victoria, Queen Victoria in the 1850s onwards, wore the Kohinoor in a brooch and then later in a circlet on her arm. Now, after Queen Victoria died in 1901, um, the diamond was set in the crown of Queen Alexandra, who was the wife of King Edward VII. And then it was transferred to the crown of Queen Mary 10 years later in 1911, who was the wife of King George V. And finally, um, it rested on this crown, which is the crown of the Queen Mother. And as you can see, the crown I showed you previously here on the head of the Queen Mother, on, the, on her coronation as Queen Consort in 1937. And in 1937, you have an image on the right of our current Queen, who is now in our 90s, but that's Queen Elizabeth II um, there. Now, if we want to um, just explore London a little further, you can go back to South Kensington and you can cross the road um, from the Victoria and Albert Museum. And next door to the V&A is the Natural History Museum. Now this museum exhibits a vast range of specimens from various segments of natural history, where another version of the Gohinur of really more interest to seek audiences can be seen. Now, when you go downstairs in this museum, you see the vault. And the vault of the museum displays some of the world's most unique and valuable treasures, including replicas of the Kohinoor. And, they, and this is what they have on display. So what you have is the left-hand diamond here replica. The left-hand side is actually the Kohinoor um, as it was um, in the times of the Sikh kingdom um, before it was brought here. It's quite lackluster cut um, of the original diamond and it failed to impress viewers at the Great Exhibition of 1851. So the Europeans described it as lackluster here in terms of the cut, but it was quite a, um, what they call as a Mughal cut here. What they did to the diamond in 1851 onwards is recut it from its original size of um, 186 old carrots on the left. So that's 186 old carrots. And after the exhibition, they took it away they imported some diamond cutters from Europe. They placed them in um, the Strand in London. They built some more machinery to cut this diamond and they recut it into this European style um, on, the, on the right here. And when they recut it, they reduced its weight from 186 old carats down to 105.6 carats. And if we do comparisons, it went down from 38.2 gram down to 21.2 but the version on the right, as you can see, gleams a lot more for European audiences. And that's the diamond then that was set in the crown here, which is this cut here. Now, during the Sikh empire period, the Kohinoor came into the possession of Maharaja Ranjit Singh in 1813. And this is how it was worn um, by the Maharaja. It was worn as an armlet, um, as seen here, and it's set in gold enamel, rock, crystal, glass, rubies, pearls, and silk. And this armlet is also within the collection of the Royal Collection Trust. So not as is the diamond um, probably being replaced with a replica from the crown. Actually, all of this detail and these pearls and this silk is also kept 
in the Royal Collection still today. Now, there are, there are images available, um, like I've got here. So this is Maharaja Ranjit Singh on the left, and he's wearing the Gohinoor diamond on his arm. But also his son, I mean, this very famous painting by Augustus Schweift, um, he's wearing the Gohinoor diamond as well um, on his arm, and various other armlets. Um, but this painting, he's also wearing the Timor rubies. He's also carrying the Shamshids and all of these necklaces and jewelry, many of which was also displayed at that great exhibition of 1851. So these diamonds uh, is legendary. In London, you can, see many, you can see many replicas as well as the original if you know where to go. But nowadays, um, there's been a project, a very modern project by the Anglo-Sikh Virtual Museum, by um, the Sikh Museum Initiative in England, um, Gurinder Singh Man in Leicester. But he's been working with Taran 3D, Taranjit Singh, and they have a website here, anglosikmuseum.com forward slash relics. And I really would encourage people, you know, after this tour to be on their phone and go to this website, which I hope someone will put on the chat box below. And what you do is you can go in and you can zoom in and zoom out and you can explore the diamond in its original form um, when it was in the ownership of the Maharaja. And this is by a project called the Anglo-Sikh Museum. So I'll just play that once more before we head on. And you can actually zoom in, zoom out as part of all these items on display on the left-hand side. These are all from the Sikh kingdoms. And it's actually, I know this is the America version of the show, so you don't have to be in London to see this. As long as you've got an internet connection and a phone, you'll be fine. Just um, go in and explore. And for the young children, you'll know exactly what to do. You don't need any coaching. You'll be fine. And you can actually teach your parents or grandparents more about 3D technology on their phone. It's quite a nice intergenerational activity, um, especially in our Gurdwaras where we try and display this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to end at the V&A and we're going to travel across London. We're going to go to the east, to the boundary between the city of London and the London Borough of Tower Hamlets. And that's where the Tower of London is located. Now, this is actually a fortress and was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. That's nearly 1,000 years ago. It's preserved um, as a heritage site. Um, and it's got lots and lots of different stories associated with it, with all the various kings and queens over the last thousand years or so. But it serves now um, um, to function as a protector of the crown jewels. So if we go down a page. So these are the famous beef eater yeoman warders on the left here in red. Um, and they are the traditional guards of the Tower of London. But it also has legendary stories associated with the ravens here. And within this complex, you'll have the crown jewels chamber, which you enter and you'll see all of the crown jewels on display. Um, and there's usually, it's like a travelator. You stand on this travelator and you go across this room and you can see the jewels, but you can't really get off the travelator. And you just, just go through the room and to the rest of the uh, complex. Um, you do pay to go in, um, but every Indian or every Punjabi or many Sikhs that visit, their sole focus is to take a glimpse of this famous diamond, the legendary Kohinoor. Now, today, the legendary Kohinoor is um, kept on a crown. It's only been worn by female members of the royal family. And Victoria, Queen Victoria in the 1850s onwards, wore the Gohinoor in a brooch and then later in a circlet on her arm. Now, after Queen Victoria died in 1901, um, the diamond was set in the crown of Queen Alexandra, who was the wife of King Edward VII. And then it was transferred to the crown of Queen Mary 10 years later in 1911, who was the wife of King George V. And finally, um, it rested on this crown, which is the crown of the Queen Mother. And as you can see, the crown I showed you previously here on the head of the Queen Mother, on, the, on her coronation as Queen Consort in 1937. And in 1937, you have an image on the right 
of our current queen, who is now in our 90s, but that's Queen Elizabeth II um, there. Now, if we want to um, just explore London a little further, you can go back to South Kensington and you can cross the road um, from the Victoria and Albert Museum. And next door to the V&A is the Natural History Museum. Now this museum exhibits a vast range of specimens from various segments of natural history, where another version of the Gohinur of really more interest to seek audiences can be seen. Now, when you go downstairs in this museum, you see the vault. And the vault of the museum displays some of the world's most unique and valuable treasures including replicas of the Kohinoor. And, they, and this is what they have on display. So what you have is the left-hand diamond here replica. The left-hand side is actually the Kohinoor um, as it was um, in the times of the Sikh kingdom um, before it was brought here. It's quite lackluster cut um, of the original diamond and it failed to impress viewers at the great exhibition of 1851. So the Europeans described it as lacklustre here in terms of the cut, but it was quite a, um, what they call as a Mughal cut here. What they did to the diamond in 1851 onwards is recut it from its original size of um, 186 old carrots on the left. So that's 186 old carrots. And after the exhibition, they took it away. They imported some diamond cutters from Europe. They placed them in um, the Strand in London. They built some more machinery to cut this diamond and they recut it into this European style um, on, the, on the right here. And when they recut it, they reduced its weight from 186 old carrots down to 105.6 carrots. And if we do comparisons, it went down from 38.2 grams down to 21.2. But the version on the right, as you can see, gleams a lot more for European audiences. And that's the diamond then that was set in the crown here, which is this cut here. Now, during the Sikh empire period, the Kohinoor came into the possession of Maharaja Ranjit Singh in 1813. And this is how it was worn um, by the Maharaja. It was worn as an armlet, um, as seen here, and it's set in gold, enamel, rock, crystal, glass, rubies, pearls, and silk. And this armlet is also within the collection of the Royal Collection Trust. So not as is the diamond um, probably being replaced with a replica from the crown. Actually, all of this detail and these pearls and this silk is also kept in the Royal Collection still today. Now, there are, there are images available um, like I've got here. So this is Maharaja Ranjit Singh on the left, and he's wearing the Gohinoor diamond on his arm, but also his son, I mean, this very famous painting by Augustus Schweift, um, he's wearing the Gohinoor diamond as well um, on his arm and various other armlets. Um, but this painting, he's also wearing the Timor rubies. He's also carrying the Shamshids and all of these necklaces and jewelry many of which was also displayed at that great exhibition of 1851. So these diamonds uh, is legendary. In London, you can, see many, you can see many replicas as well as the original if you know where to go. But nowadays, um, there's been a project, a very modern project by the Anglo-Sikh Virtual Museum, by um, the Sikh Museum Initiative in England, um, Gurinder Singh Man in Leicester. But he's been working with Taran 3D, Taranjit Singh, and they have a website here, anglosikmuseum.com forward slash relics. And I really would encourage people, you know, after this tour to be on their phone and go to this website, which I hope someone will put on the chat box below. And what you do is you can go in and you can zoom in and zoom out and you can explore the diamond in its original form um, when it was in the ownership of the Maharaja. And this is by a project called the Anglo-Sikh Museum. So I'll just play that once more before we head on. And you can actually zoom in, zoom out as part of all these items on display on the left-hand side. These are all from the Sikh kingdoms. And it's actually, I know this is the America version of the show, so you don't have to be in London to see this. As long as you've got an internet connection and a phone, 
you'll be fine. Just um, go in and explore. And for the young children, you'll know exactly what to do. You don't need any coaching. You'll be fine. And you can actually teach your parents or grandparents more about 3D technology on their phone. It's quite a nice intergenerational activity, um, especially in our gurdwaras where we try and display this. We're just going to go to our last stop on this tour now. We're going to head to the Museum of London. Now, the Museum of London is close to um, St. Paul's Cathedral and overlooks the remains of the Roman city um, on the edge of the oldest part of London. Now, it's in the process of being moved. So in a few years time, they'll have a new, new museum. But it actually, the current museum actually sits, the entrance sits in a roundabout. And then you come up into this museum building here. Um, it, I think it's quite a lovely museum because it's concerned with the social history of London, its inhabitants throughout time, and documents the UK's capital city from prehistoric to modern times. So in, it's here in this museum that we have a piece of art by um, some famous um, artists called the Singh Twins, Liverpool-based sisters, the Singh Twins. And at this part, I'm just going to hand over to introduce this aspect by Sonia. Thank you, Rav. So uh, the Singh twins uh, are Amrit and Rabinder Kaur Singh. They are contemporary British artists from uh, Liverpool and who have been widely recognized as the artistic face of modern Britain. Because through their art, they engage with social, political and cultural issues and they connect history with the contemporary, challenging the Eurocentric perceptions. And amongst their many awards are the member of the British Empire and inclusion in the Oxford Encyclopedia of Women in World History. So uh, Rav, I'm really thrilled that you have included contemporary art in your tour today, because this is, this is our future. Our contemporary artists are the ones who are engaging with the world and creating our space in it and influencing in real time how the world sees us, the Sikh community. And I want to share with you uh, some shocking statistics here. That is, works by women artists make up only three to 5% of all museum collections in the United States. It's a shocking statistic. And the second one is, that less than 15% of works uh, in permanent collections of the museums in the United States are by artists of color. It is the Singh twins and other contemporary artists that are helping change this statistic, which is a huge contribution. And it is also an act of bravery on their part to embrace their tradition as a profession, despite all pushback. Now, unfortunately, I have not had the opportunity to visit the Museum of London and see this work uh, by, the, by the artists for myself. In fact, I did not even know about it. And so uh, thank you, Rav, for sharing this. And I will today, but share with you some details of one of their works, which is in this museum, based on the details that the artists have shared with me themselves. So, uh, both the, the Singh twins, they started uh, with, by studying these two paintings by the Victorian artist Henry Nelson O'Neill. The two paintings, of one on the left is Eastward Ho, and that represents the departure of the British uh, soldiers from England in 1857 to quell the Indian mutiny of 1857, also known now as the First War of Independence. And then the painting on the right uh, is, which shows us uh, the British soldiers, they're coming back, they're returning home. And the title of the painting is Home Again. It was done in 1858. And it shows uh, these soldiers coming back. They are jaded and they're forlorn. And the whole ambience of the two paintings is very different. So th these two works were the starting points for, uh, for the artist uh, to create this piece, which is on display 
uh, at the London Museum and it is called Entwined. And what the artists did was they interpreted and extended the symbolism of these two Victorian paintings into this work, which is the Entwined. And as you can see, this is a very complex painting. So as we talk about the details, please follow our cursor, which will help you identify the different characters uh, in, in the artwork. So the artists, they started with O'Neill's idea, but they replaced many of the original figures with other characters, including those that represent India's heroes of the conflict. So now you're looking at it from a different perspective. This is not a Eurocentric perspective. So when you look at the left side of the painting, we see the depiction of Mangal Pandey uh, as he was in the Bollywood film. And then there is Rani Lakshmi Bai on a horse right below. Alongside them, sorry, above them, are watching from a burst of clouds above are the notable campaigners from India's long history of struggle for freedom against successive waves of foreign invasion. As we move to the right of the painting, almost seen as disembarking from the ship. If you recall uh, the, the Victorian painting, what you see here are now Sikh veterans of the First and Second World Wars. And they are representing the role that Indians played in the British uh, army. And they also represent the beginnings of Indian migration to Britain. Those are the boy Maharaja Dalip Singh, which is shown at the bottom of the painting. And then the artist's own father and grandmother. You see the lady in this uh, vibrant pink uh, salwar kameez and uh, alongside a small boy with a stethoscope around his neck. So this is the artist's grandmother and their father. The father grows up to be a medical doctor. So the stethoscope is, is because of that. So, so the artists are bringing their personal connection to this whole history as it is unfolding. And they themselves are depicted in this piece. Uh, if you look towards the bottom and you see them holding a paintbrush and a desk calendar, wearing the official Singh Tartan, one of the many symbols of British multiculturalism. Now, moving to the left again, we see along the pier, a composite British cityscape made up of some of the main towns and cities of Asian settlement together with the famous faces of Bollywood, Hollywood, and the UK, including the England cricketer, Monty Panesar, Prince Charles, Madonna, Victoria Beckham, all symbolize cross-cultural influence, the outcome of Anglo-Indian relations, and the positive contributions of British Asians. And framing all of this are these red words swirling around the border, which though have been long accepted to be parts of the English language, but actually are Indian in origin. For example, jungle, uh, juggernaut, and pajamas. So those words are the ones that are all around. But uh, popping out from the painting is our beloved Foja Singh, and who, and in the background, we see the Princess Sophia Dalip Singh, who is standing up for women's voting rights in the early 20th century. As we move outside the, this frame, uh, up towards uh, the top margins, we see quotations from the illustrated London news on the Anglo-Sikh wars, Prince Feroz Shah on his fight with the British, Tony Blair on the Kosovo campaign, and George W. Bush on the post 9-11 war on terror. And these can be seen flowing around the border and contained within the cartoshes. These are actually serving to make an analogy uh, between the official propaganda and the rhetoric that is used by the British Empire and that that is used by the modern day superpowers to justify their colonization of foreign lands. Now, this, this painting, Rav, I think we could spend the whole show we could do on just this one piece. And uh, because it has so many details in it, uh, there's stories that are entwined. There's a delightful mix of the historical, the contemporary and the serious and the lighthearted. But unfortunately, we have to leave it here. And I hope many of you will be motivated to actually go back, 
visit the museum and see this magnificent piece for themselves. Uh, Rav, um, I, I, you know the same twins personally. So is there any particular painting that by them that has touched you? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you, Sonia. So I'm beginning to get to know them better. I was very reluctant. I always used to feel that I'm, um, um, I'm, I'm interrupting their work every time I used to contact them in years gone by. Um, but now we, we seem to be on better terms since December. Um, and I think just this week, you know, we're, we're in the first days of June and it's um, a time of memorial um, to remember the events of 1984. And this painting um, by the Singh Twins um, is called 1984. Um, and it really does, in the same way, the detailed stories are captured around those events that took place um, in June 36 years ago. And for me, um, partly when I first saw this painting, it wasn't just the painting, it's where it was, because I believe this was on display at the Smithsonian. Um, in America um, as part of the Punjab galleries um, and just to see at, at least this painting on display meant that those events that took place the story of those events could be shared from a Sikh perspective with with people outside of the Sikh faith um, and that's why this this painting is quite um, dear to me because um, because of the way it's, it, it depicts lots of stories but also presents them in a, in a gallery that attracts um, other visitors, you know, not just from the Sikh community. And again, we could spend a lot of time talking through this painting, um, but we all, you can explore this on the website um, and even on their social media, I think they were posting it last week and I think the Sikh Foundation also shared it um, with the captions that you can go and explore more and see. Thank you, Raf, for sharing this memory and also commemorating the memory of uh, Operation Blue Star in 1984. And I think uh, through this painting, Sikhs have been able to share uh, their personal tragedy and the injustice by the structures of power with the whole world. And this is really the, the power of the arts. And we at this moment are also in a time uh, when there is a movement for change of, uh, and social justice is gaining momentum in the United States. And this is with support from all over the world. Uh, Mr. George Floyd was killed by the Minneapolis police on May 25th, and he is now the face of this movement. And I pause here to remember his life and of the many other African-Americans, some of whose names are commemorated on this mural, on this powerful mural, which is created by a collective of artists. And I also remind my community that it was the activism of the African-Americans led by Dr. Martin Luther King that saw the passing of the Immigration Act of 1965, opening the door for me and others like me to make America our home. So I'm sure our artists will engage with what is happening around the world and share our perspective with the world. And with this, uh, we come to the end of this inaugural tour. And I thank you, Ranveer, for enthusiastically sharing your research, your knowledge, and your expertise with all of us. I really wish I had known, uh, met you earlier during my previous trips to the UK and your tours would have made all the difference and made it so much more enriching for me. Uh, but uh, before we take questions, Ranveer, can you please uh, give us a sneak preview of the next tour that is planned? Thank you, thank you, Sonia. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's part of the reason we're called A Little History of the Sikhs is we have a zero marketing budget. So, so, so people only find out through word of mouth that that suits me. But uh, hopefully after this, um, this episode, we'll get some more international visitors. So on the 24th of June, so it's two weeks today, um, we will be visiting some famous churches in London. So we will look at Westminster Abbey and St. Paul's Cathedral, where all the royal weddings take place. We'll visit St. Luke's Church in Chelsea. We'll visit the Pembroke College Mission. And I've got so many other churches. Um, and I just want to take you into those churches 
and I want to show you the hidden Sikh stories that are on display, but relatively unknown by the Sikh community and definitely unknown by the Sikh community. It's unknown by the Christian community as well. And they, they, they've kept this stuff, you know, just memorialized. And I'm just gonna take you into those churches. And they all feature in the tours because they're always en route. Um, and if we can get in for free, it's, um, it's all the better. So that's what we'll be doing on the 24th of June um, at the 10 a.m. time, and then we'll repeat it at 7 p.m. We have been joined by uh, Tarun Singh, who is the uh, creator of the spectacular 3D model of the Kohinoor uh, that we were able to see today. And uh, he is uh, uh, also creating a number of these models. I have a question to ask uh, Tarun. So Tarun, welcome to the show. Hi, Sonia. Thanks for having me. Very nice. Uh, just the spectacular uh, models that you have created. Amazing work. And one of the things I'd like to know is, uh, what is the process by which you create uh, these uh, stunning models. Can you just walk us through right from, you know, how do you start and, and how it ends up to this uh, wonderful image? Of course, yeah. First, what we do is we start to research the object and collect as much information about the object as we can, studying the design and the physical makeup, uh, the type of materials. And we also look at the damage and wear and tear of the object as well to try and recreate that and, and, and preserve that. Uh, once we understand the object, we start to build a 3D model using computer aided design software. Uh, and once we have a 3D model, we start to unwrap and add color and physical material properties so that the object will respond to a light environment as a real object would. Once we have a, that a kind of a, a object ready, we can then insert it into a game engine or an online WebGL engine, which means that people can look at it and manipulate it in real time. And we've even been able to put these objects into virtual reality headsets as well. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, for, for the Kohinoor that we saw, uh, mm -hmm. how many images do you need to click to, to create something like this? So with the Kohinoor, we only had like a few images and some drawings as well. So some of it, we actually have to take a bit of artistic license and make it up from photographs. So for example, um, you know, we only had kind of minimal photographs. So there was a lot of kind of manual work in terms of recreating the material textures and, and colors. So the, so the depth, if you see the width of the piece, is that something then you have to work in into, into the design? Yeah, so we kind of used, like we said, we did the research. So we look at the kind of uh, documentation descriptions that people have given. And also we try and get in touch with the museums as well to see if we can get access to the objects. So sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. But if we can't, we will use whatever information we have. And sometimes we just kind of um, kind of use our own kind of artistic eye to, to kind of um, create the object. So... Uh... What are the next upcoming models that uh, we should look out for that you're working on? Yeah, so we've got um, some really nice items from the uh, Royal Armouries in Leeds. So we've got three items coming from there. And we've also got three items, including um, the Thals, which uh, Rav showed you earlier. Uh, we've got a 3D model of that. And we're hoping to be able to put that into a virtual reality environment where you can actually pick it up and, and start to hear it and listen to it or try to play it. So as well as being able to see the objects, we want people to be able to, especially children, to be able to engage with the objects, hold them, pick them up and, and kind of manipulate them in their hands. So already within our current VR experience, you can actually uh, click on the object and hold the swords and the different shields in your hands, as well as the jewelry as well. Wonderful. So uh, as, as a creator, you started with these uh, objects. Uh, but what is the future potential that you see to use this technology for the preservation and the conservation of our arts or maybe our architectural material heritage uh, books? So it, it, it are, could you share a bit of that? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I mean, there's so many applications uh, that will be coming. So one of the applications that we've been looking at is 3D printing. So the ability to be able to create replicas of objects. 
Um, and also, once you have a digital virtual object, it means that you don't have to transport the, the, the object, you don't have to insure the object. So it means that uh, you could make infinite copies and everyone around the world can experience the same object um, without having all that kind of um, you, you know, the cost involved with uh, creating exhibitions. Um, so once we have a virtual object, it's preserved. So in future, if, if we do ever lose these objects or we don't have access to them, um, you know, people can still show them to their children, which I think is one of the main reasons that drove me to start to create these 3D models, because there were so many objects, beautiful objects from my history, which we didn't have access to. And I thought it was a shame, you know, that I wouldn't be able to show my children these objects. So being able to create them in 3D and be able to see them in front of you in a VR environment is probably the next best thing from actually being there at the museum. You can't replace the museum, but it, it's, it's the next best experience that we can, we can have. So it's so you get feedback from your kids when you create uh, the pieces? <laughs> yeah, I do. I always kind of get them to have a look at it when we did the augmented reality exhibition where you can actually hold a card and you can see the object in front of you. Um, we, we try to add a bit of playfulness to the experience uh, so that children can have a bit of fun. And then afterwards, we can have a conversation with them. Oh, look, what, which sword did you hold? Or which piece of jewelry? And then we've even been able to 3D print some of these objects. And like we did uh, from the Victorian Albert Museum, we had arrows that we were able to 3D print and give these to the children because they were non-sharp and be able to look at the design of them so they could draw or start to paint them. And uh, because it was relatively cheap to 3D print, we could give them away as little souvenirs that they could take away with them. That's fabulous. I think those are amazing uh, possibilities and potential. And it's good because the, the, the younger generation is the future. And uh, what you're doing, we really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see more and more of your work. So I would like you, all of you to visit uh, their website, uh, which is, um, can you say the name of the website, uh, Tharan? Yeah, it's the angloseekmuseum.com. Great. Thank you very much, Tarun. It was a pleasure to speak with you today. And uh, also thank you for your help with this show. Uh, you have been uh, just absolutely awesome uh, helping us out, just getting this whole set up. And I'd also like to thank uh, Tanit Gujral, uh, the program director of the Sikh Foundation for bringing all of this together. And also Sukhamrit Singh and Rajinder Singh who have created the app, which I talked about earlier, uh, the Sikh Foundation International app uh, for the Sikh Foundation. And all these images that we shared with you are available on the app, uh, which you can enjoy uh, at your leisure.